Well, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Ghostology 101. My name is uh, Gavin Kelly, and this is Paula Purcell. Hello. In this seminar, we're going to go ahead and teach you the fundamentals of becoming a paranormal investigator. Of course, we will discuss the trade and the tools that we use and how to use them. We'll walk you through our process step by step, and you'll also learn what it's meant by taking a baseline reading. Um, what you can look for to determine what is normal before stating anything is paranormal. False positives. False positives basically taken the paranormal realm by storm, so we'll go ahead and discuss numerous topics on that. But the main thing is, is there's anybody here that wants to be a ghost hunter, beginning a ghost hunter. So we will go over the basics, what to bring, what to use, and how to go about an investigation. This is the process we do on each of our investigations. These are just some of the places that we've actually been to. Uh, Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, lots of places all over the United States. We've investigated places all the way up to uh, the Queen Mary in Anaheim, California. Well, actually, Long Beach, California. And uh, USS Lexington and Corpus Christi, Texas. St. Albans Sanatorium in Radford, Virginia. Just so many places that we have actually been to. And the list just keeps going on and on, and just <laughs> it's amazing. But there are differences. I'm not sure if anybody is aware of this. Ghost hunting versus paranormal investigations. They're two separate things. First off, let me explain the difference between ghost hunting and paranormal investigations. Although it may seem like the same thing, there is a difference of the methodology and, of course, the objectives of each. Ghost hunting, generally speaking, refers to the action of setting out to find proof of the afterlife based on paranormal activity. This is typically done in locations previously deemed as active. So all those locations that you just saw on the screen, that would be basically considered for ghost hunting. Paranormal investigation, now this is what we do and other folks do. Paranormal investigation, however, is performed by a team who sets out to collect evidence to prove or disprove claims of suggestions of paranormal activity. This is typically performed by a client requesting assistance for us to validate or debunk claims of the paranormal experiences. Before the investigations, father fact gathering and research. The best tool at your disposal is facts. Our job at Paranormal Investigations is to gather as much information as possible. This information will be crucial to perform an evident and accurate investigation. Number one, learn as much as you can about the location you're going to be investigating. Research the history of the location including possible catastrophes. Interview the client and people who are involved with the location, including residents, employees, owners, whoever might have knowledge of potential activity. They have to require ghost hunting gear. Are we doing? Now the thing is, when going back to uh, this one, learning as much about the location, you want to actually go to the location during the day, so that way you can rule out any hazardous and dangerous places or. Uh, things sticking out of the ground, wires sticking out of the walls, metal hanging from the ceiling. Because when you actually go in there to investigate at night, you don't want to hurt yourself. So that's one thing I wanted to go ahead and, and let you guys know. Uh, the required ghost hunting gear. For safety, proper documentation, we suggest having at least the very least of the following uh, devices for your investigations. An audio recorder, which you can go ahead and show you, just a regular digital recorder to actually record uh, EVPs, which is uh, electronic voice phenomenon. We have the advanced model, if you must know. Yes. <laughs> you can go very basic and buy the $20 ones at Walmart. They work as good. Yep. That's the Cadillac of all digital recorders yes. by Tascam. Uh, a run-of-the-mill flashlight. You basically want to have a flashlight so you'll be able to see. And these are heavy duty, so if it falls, it's not going to break. This one is a thousand looms. You can go all the way up to two thousand looms, but a basic standard flashlight would work. You always want to have a notebook and a pen so that way you can take notes and document what is actually happening during the time you're doing an investigation. Like my gear in the truck on that. So. Of course. And of course, a watch. While you are documenting uh, evidence, you want to be able to uh, put a time stamp 
on when that activity is actually occurring. So the so standard ghost hunting equipment and gear. Now this is probably what you've all seen on TV from all of ghost hunting shows. You got your digital camera, which is not in, up there. In the bag. We forgot. <laughs> digital camera, regardless of what you've heard, digital cameras are a great tool for ghost hunting research because now they have infrared, they have full spectrum. It's different than those other cameras that they actually have out there, like a regular digital uh, video camera. You can't really use it quote unquote at night, but you can use a full spectrum because it sees everything in, in the full spectrum from infrared to UV to full spectrum. It's the wider range. And usually at night, you're able to see more things come out at you. Infrared is almost the same thing, but uh, I would prefer to go ahead and use a full spectrum because that's what we've been using a lot for all of our investigations. Digital recorder, we've already went over that. However, the voice recorder is without a doubt the most important piece of equipment that you should have in your investigation toolbox. Now there's only one problem I have to say about having a digital recorder. Sound travels. So if you are actually in a location doing a EVP session and you actually think that you're possibly talking to somebody, it could be somebody that's maybe down the hall because sound travels. Uh, if the room is, has like an echo, it will travel also. We ran into an issue. We used that very same recorder and we were at a place called the Campbell House. We had a guy with us and he was like, okay, well, there's a claim, there's a, someone that hollers on the fourth floor and you actually can hear it. So we set that recorder up and next thing you know, I thought we heard it, but upon further evaluation, it was a car that was two blocks away with their window down and he was listening to the radio. <laughs> we, so, we go through our evidence of the time to find tooth comb. Yes, or basically how they put it, when in doubt, throw it out. EMF detector. This is an electronic magnetic field detector, otherwise known as an EMF meter. And we have one right there. It's called the MF1. And this is a three-in-one device. It monitors temperature, EMF, and geophone. So it's like uh, basically you can place it on the ground or like she's doing on the desk. If so you've got the EMF, it's, it's basically calibrating. So don't think mm -hmm. you have something haunted in here. It's just calibrating itself when <laughs> a little red light's going on. You but if you see the geo foam at the bottom, he taps on it. If you put that on a surface to where you're gonna walk away into a room and then you happen, like for us, we always put a camera in front of it or we make sure that we're in front of our DVR cameras, which we didn't bring our sample of what cameras we use, but in DVR cameras, like we have one set up in here in this room right here. And actually we have it watched to where if that happens to go off, then we'll see it on the camera. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they might not show your presence in front of you, they'll show up after you walk away. We actually use that one at Hotel Metropolitan here downtown. We place it in the threshold of the bathroom on the, was it the first floor or second floor? It's first floor. First floor. And we heard a story, there was a lady named Ashley that actually comes through that bathroom area and just dissipates. So we put the MF1 right there on the threshold and it started lighting up blue. So I was like, okay, if this is Ashley, can you make that light up even brighter? And I mean, it just went bluer than blue. And you can actually see the geophone started ticking as something was walking toward it when it was getting bluer. So it gave us the inclination it was possibly Ashley that was coming toward the device, which is really cool. And we like that. Um, this one would detect fluctuation to electromagnetic field, a low strength moving EMF field that has no source. It's a common theory that spirits disrupt this field. So the mel meter right there, uh, the antenna, it creates a EMF field, electromagnetic field around it. If anything disrupts that field, it will go off. You have to push the two buttons on the back. It's not wanting to start. Yep. <laughs> there it goes. So anything that actually disrupts that field, it will go off and make that noise and light up to give us uh, the idea that someone is actually possibly there. The tri-field meter. Now this one is the best one that uh, we have been using because this one offers uh, magnetic, electric, radio, and microwave detection all in one package. We use this one because this one rules out all man-made uh, issues. Because when you use other devices, you know, anything can go ahead and set it off by static-wise, 
but this one is for all man-made or AC electrical magnetic fields. This meter is effective in detecting man-made currents to debunk claims of the being watched, which can be easily caused by faulty wiring or electrical leakage. Electrical leakage, that's a different term. Bobby Mackey's in the basement, there is a transformer and it is a rather large transformer. If you go down there with any device, a camera, a EMF meter, a K2, it will fry it like that. So the whole thing about the issue of someone be having hallucinations down there, a wide band of EMF going out can actually mess with your head, cause you to hallucinate, cause you to get lightheadedness, and everything. So that's one thing to look out for. My favorite is the laser grid. This is something that we started using. Uh, it clearly detects movement, which happens to define a shape sometimes. And it actually has some kind of a mass to it. Um, we have uh, pointed, actually we took it to the uh, Massac County Courthouse, matter of fact. Um, we had it shining on down the hall. And if anything would come through, you would actually see that grid break. And when we go ahead and take it and put it um, in the computer from filming, you can actually take it frame by frame by frame and see what the shape is if it has a mass and that way you can kind of get an idea of what this thing actually looked like. But the laser grid emits a grid of thousands of green dots, which is usually the pen, and or the little um, black one which shows up here, it shows out a lot of uh, red squares, kind of something like Star Trek with the holodeck or something like that. Upon review, if a movement happens, it will obviously be apparent by the breaking of the laser patterns. So that's a really good device thing to use. Now going into advanced gear, so basically all that you just saw is what you usually see on TV for regular ghost hunters to use. The new stuff, thermal camera, now a lot of people are actually using this because it is a variation of temperature. You're able to see cold spots and hot spots. So if it's like really, really cold, you'll be able to uh, possibly detect uh, an entity. But uh, the FLIR one, which is right here, this one detects levels of temperature converting to electronic signals into a thermal image on the screen, which is really neat. The fluctuation of temperature can indicate the presence of an apparition or energy depending on the reading. The colder the anomaly, the more likely it could be a ghost. And we've actually uh, captured some weird things using this. Um, Most recently was in uh, Georgia at the Crime and Punishment Museum. Yes. We had a lady standing by a piano. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting there, or I was standing there going, there's something going on. And I was like, you just watch through the lens, you know, through the camera and watch very carefully. And sure enough, we had a form and you could see the skirt of the dress. And it looked like she had her hands folded like this and standing by an old, upright uh, Baldwin piano. Yep. Now, the DVR system is what you actually see right there. I'm not sure what what uh, location was that. I think the Hartford City Jail, possibly? Yes, it is. Okay. DVR is otherwise known as a digital video recorder. Now, this is like the best device to have. And the reason being is when you're at a location, this will actually record rooms where you're not. So if you're investigating, say, like maybe a ballroom, this can be recording four different cells. If you're, you know, at a jail, kind of like the Hartford City, where we were at, they actually had a ballroom. They had upstairs jail. They had living quarters. So we actually set up cameras, as you can see on that monitor, different places. Um, a couple jail cells, hallways. Yeah. We got the dungeon. The du dungeon, yes. Uh huh. So setting up the DVR camera strategically will assist anyone with, uh, during the investigation, the unit will monitor and record all visual activity in the rooms that you haven't investigated yet. ITC, I'm not sure if anybody is aware of what that is, but ITC stands for Instrumental Transcommunication. And it's safe to say that just about every paranormal investigator out there has used it and there are numerous devices. This one I just pulled up is the Ovulus 3. This one is actually a phonetic generator. Um, what happens is if a spirit is trying to talk to you, it actually uses the energy around the Ovulus 3 
and it can manipulate the dictionary that's in there. It's like a 15,000 word dictionary in there, so it can actually possibly pick something up and talk to you. We've had that work maybe 30% of the time, and it was somewhat accurate, but with having a 15,000 word dictionary, it's, it's power of suggestion, in other words. Um, the Spirit Box, the SB7. This one is actually an AM and FM radio. It sweeps. You can make it sweep backwards and forwards. It does nine different channels. Um, so if anything actually comes over that frequency, it's very well possible you might have captured a voice, but it's a good chance that you're actually capturing something from a radio station. However, we did a place in Simsonia, Kentucky, and it was Carter's Mill. I don't know if you all know about Carter's Mill. It's now gone, but we were in a room, it was like the old mill, and we started looking around, and underneath one of the uh, porches, there was a bunch of jugs. One of our investigators said, hey, it looks like someone did moonshine here. Right across the SB7, it said, moonshine? And it was as southern as you can possibly get. Yeah, and the thing is, I understand it is a power of suggestion, however, moonshine at that given time, when we're talking about jugs, I just don't think that's possible. Plus, then we proceed on asking a couple more questions mm -hmm. to see if we could pull out if it had thought of our thoughts or whatever. And I ask, what have y'all used to do in this area? And then we had gotten the same southern woman come mm -hmm. across the SB7 and said, picnic? And I mean, it was a drawn out, a southern a draw that you could possibly get out of this. And there was no way a radio station could pick up something at that precise point, right. at that precise moment, getting that, that dialect and that southern accent across. And the other thing to do if you're going to use the SB7 is ask questions, not basically like, why did you die? Why are you here? Ask questions where it would be difficult for a radio station to actually come through with a word like uh, what's your favorite color what's your favorite food what kind of car do you, did you drive were you in a buggy were you on do you like horses and stuff like that there's just really no way a radio station gonna jump through and say yes horse pizza well I don't know maybe pizza because there's a lot of commercials on the radio but it's a good possibility for that but Let's get into explaining what is normal. This is the main problem that we have to kind of separate before anything can quote unquote be considered paranormal. Things listed below will help you determine the normal occurrence. There are plenty of things which can be easily defined paranormal. However, there is a plausible explanation too. Vacuum. This is a space devoid of air or matter which causes suction. Now, if you are in a house and you're in a hallway, there's a door on this side and there's a door on this side. If someone is over here walking toward the door and you shut that other door, either A, this one's gonna open or this one's going to close in front of you. That's due to a vacuum and I've seen that lots of time on uh, those TV shows, you know, paranormal TV shows, and I'm just like, oh, wait a minute, that's actually a vac vacuum. Same thing happens if uh, you go ahead and shut the door, a window, if, le if the window's kind of open this way, the door shutting will cause that. Uh, reverse the fact, if you open a window real quick, it'll probably cause the door behind you to shut. Now that's actually happened to us at St. Albans. Mm -hmm. um, sounds, we already, got onto this one vibrations that travel through the air or another medium that can be heard when they reach a person's ear footsteps knocks shuffling moans voices creaking now we can go into lighting this one's an interesting topic the act of lighting is illuminating, also called luminous energy, radiant energy, or electromagnetic radiation. Camera flash, IR lighting, outside contamination, and of course a flashlight. All these things that I'm actually telling you is what some people actually think are causing paranormal um, activity within a location or a house, business. So these are the things that you really need to look out for um let's see mist now these are interesting 
cloud light aggregation of minute uh, droplets of water suspended in the atmosphere or near the Earth's surface. That's a little deep. Uh, reducing visibility, lesser degree than fog. Breath. Now see, when you're actually doing video, you will think you're seeing possibly what you think is a ghost or an apparition, but it could be your breath, depending on how cold it is. Someone vaping, because that's going to travel. There is going to be an airflow no matter what. So if somebody is vaping on down the hall or outside, it may actually come through the cracks into the building. Exhaust. There was an issue when we were at a cemetery and uh, we were far enough away from the parking lot, but somebody was in their car trying to stay warm. So the exhaust from their car had some nice little misty smoke going through the graveyard and looked like uh, dry ice going across. Steam, same thing. And of course, smoke. Whenever we do an investigation, if we invite people to come with us, that's one of the rules. No smoking, no vaping, because that's going to cause a lot of false positives when it comes to us filming and taking pictures. So we don't want to do that. Visible vapor and gas is given off by burning or smoldering, smoldering substance, especially gray, brown, or blackish mixture of gases. That basically takes us back to the exhaust. So airflow. Flowing past or through moving bodies of large mass, draft or air or circulation. An open door, open window, that's a given. Cracks in the wall. We were at Old South Pittsburgh Hospital and it wasn't really cold, but then all of a sudden a draft just went right in because it was really windy outside and the air was coming through the cracks of the building right into where we were, giving us false readings on all of our devices because the temperature was uh, 65, it dropped all the way down to 53 due to it coming through the cracks. And the reason why we know that because we actually set up a fog machine and it was supposed to like just stay in the room, it went out the cracks. So we know there were cracks. Poor insulation, that's a definite. Knocking. Strike or sound blow with the fist, knuckles, or anything hard, especially a door or window. The reason for this one, it can be critters in the walls. Actually, I covered that. Um, tree branches hitting the side of the building. If it's windy outside and a tree branch hits the side of the house, you're actually going to think that you're hearing someone knocking on the door. Uh, possibly footsteps on your porch, if you have a, a wooden porch. And of course, wind. So. Paranormal, relating to the claim occurrence of an event or perception without scientific explanation as psychokinesis, extrasensory perception, or other supernatural phenomenon. There is no definitive answer to this question. If it is unexplainable, then this means there is no explanation. Then it could be considered paranormal, but that's where going over your evidence thoroughly comes into play. There's been numerous times, if you do not go through your evidence, you're basically gonna be eaten alive. There are instances when we actually go through our evidence, and I'll give you a prime example. A buddy of mine that was our uh, editor called me up and he's like, dude, one of the footage that we took at Old South Pittsburgh Hospital, it looks like it is an actual apparition that shows up in the doorway and disappears. So right away I jump at it, I'm like, wow, we actually captured something, but we kind of dug into it a little bit deeper, changed some filters on it, and come to find out it was Paula walking down with the DVR cable, stopped at the corner, and went around the other side. But it actually showed up that she was a quote-unquote apparition. If we would have let that go, you really wouldn't have known the difference, but we don't want to do that. We want to be true 100%. We do not want to put any fake evidence out there. False positives. You want to do false positives? I can, it don't matter. There you go. Okay, the things it. listed below can give you false positive readings when you're near them. Some of these things generate EM fields that surround the objects and are a few feet thick, so you do not have to be right on top of it to get a reading. Even two to seven milligas readings can be given off by something natural. So try to trace out your source. Find out the natural occurrences and where it comes from. These are the essential indoors. Computers, cell phones, clock radios, walkies, microwaves, appliances, electronic outlets, power lines, fluorescent lights, rechargeable batteries, copper pipes, electrical lines in the walls or floors. Some of our devices, we, were proved, we had an investigation in uh, uh, Mississippi, in Biloxi, Mississippi. We were at uh, 
uh, Jefferson the, Davis's plantation. The Bovar. Yeah, the Bovar. And uh, they had this guy that was so sincere that he had an attachment on one of his books. And he laid this book in the middle of his floor underneath his glass case. And everybody had come in there, their, their uh, mail meters and their uh, K2s kept going off like crazy. And we were like, there's something to this. There's not, this is, cannot be this. You know, so we always dive debunk as much as possible, and come to find out there was a air conditioning unit running underneath where those books were laying that was causing the mail meter and the K2 to hit spontaneously. When you move the books away from the target area, because I moved the whole casing away from the center of where the guy set it, and I set it over here, and I was like, okay, if there is an attachment, there's still going to be a reading on this. Mm -hmm. Went over there. We didn't have a reading. We moved him back to where the guy had him across the air conditioning ducts, and boom, we had the reading again. And so that's when we found out there was air conditioning ducts running underneath. We explained to the guy what was going on, and he was a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, if you actually experience any of the following symptoms, it may mean you might have ghostly activity, especially if you experience one or more of these listed. Electrical appliances. The lights happen to turn off on and off by themselves. Hearing footsteps, tapping or bumps in your home. You frequently experience cold spots or room temperature dramatically drops. You hear voices, music or smells such as perfume or cigarette smoke or cigar smoke and a foul odor. She had a house fire. This is what started our whole paranormal investigating. It uprooted something at her house. I'm not sure exactly what it was, but she started having weird things happen. Um, objects would move from one room to another. There was a sound of a bouncing ball that went down the hallway. And that was witnessed by everybody in the house. Mm -hmm. And then we started having perfume. It smelled like uh, back in the day, the old days. And it would go from the dining room all the way down the hallway and then dissipate. And it was like really fragrancy or yeah, something. Yeah, very strong in fragrancy. The feeling of being watched or being touched by unseen hands. Me and her, I, I, will, I can go ahead and say we have been touched, slapped, scratched, pushed, uh, kicked, tripped by unseen forces. I know there's a lot of skeptics out there that will not believe in that, but when it happens to you, you'll become a believer. You see shadows moving back and forth or appearing out of the corner of your eye. And of course things in your home move on their own and you see balls of light or you see an apparition. And of course what we discussed earlier, if one of those things happen, it can be man-made. But if you have two or three of those things, or maybe four of those things happening, you might want to have someone come investigate your house. <laughs> All right. The moment you guys have probably been waiting for our evidence. This right here is the Weldon Manor in Central City, Kentucky. Um, we're using the Kinect camera, which you can see on the far uh, right. As you can see, it's actually going one frame a second. We actually believe that is a portal. We never witnessed a portal, but you're actually seeing it live right there. And after it's done, we have a stick figure that shows up seven foot tall and waves. Now the Kinect camera is basically set up to, see, there it is, and he will wave. And he liked music. We, we, I, I, sometimes I get a feeling of a location where we're at and I felt like music needed to be played for this gentleman. So I was like, you know what, when he played some music. So I went through, you know, time period music. Um, you had 20s and 30s, and you're just going... i go back here for a second. Go ahead. You got 20s and 30s music on that, and uh, we had... Uh, that wasn't working. Went to the Beach Boys. That wasn't working. You know what his favorite person he wanted to listen to? Elvis. Yep. <laughs> Believe it or not. We turned on some Elvis, and that may... We have, later on in that footage, we have him to where he is snapping his finger and, and it looks like foot. he's tapping his foot in that mm -hmm. in that stick figure so it was very interesting so this is my house this is what started us all mm -hmm. uh, this is part of the Kerner plantation 
and uh, if you can see the picture uh, there's looks like a little boy peering right here inside the camera here we happen to take a picture and right at that time we were taking random pictures and we happen to take the picture and that was caught uh, in the view screen you can't see it in the room but you can see it on the view screen just for that instant second now there is a little boy in my house he's four years old I did a lot of research took me a couple of months to work on it before we did the investigation got some more answers after we did the investigation I contacted the great-grandchildren of the former plantation owners the grandchild lives out in California she goes oh yeah honey I'll send you some pictures you sent me a pictures and uh, there was a picture of the little boy that is exactly is the same image is in that one picture and over here is William Kerner which is the man's father yes I have him too <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah it's an interesting Thanksgiving dinner at my house anyway um, that gentleman we were having a birthday party for Gavin and I was taking pictures and and of course the picture has been edited but he's actually standing, sitting in front of his birthday cake and I took a picture and there is a reflection in the mirror you know when I went to go through the pictures like whoa wait a minute that's you know and then I happened to look at the picture and I was like wait a minute I've seen that pic I've seen that man somewhere somewhere so I already had the pictures this was taken after the fact of the investigation and we pulled that and then that's when I found the picture of the old man and the picture of the, the image that you see in the window. Yep. This one is really interesting. Um, this is part of the plantation house again. Basically the whole plantation went from the Kerner Street all the way up to where uh, Walmart is. That was all considered a Kerner Plantation. We're talking about over hundreds and hundreds of acres. We've investigated several houses in our neighborhood, if you must know. And this is another house in the neighborhood that we were told that we need to come investigate. And we caught this in daytime. Mm -hmm. This, you know, nine times out of ten, even though it's important to investigate at nighttime because you can, that's when you get your best evidence. This best evidence we got just doing a daytime, because we do both. We do a daytime investigation and a nighttime investigation. Because, number one, we know when, like he said earlier, we need to know our surroundings. Things. Well, we, you know, took some pictures and we did, you know, just our basic, you know, this is what we need to avoid. This is what we need to watch out for. If there's a hole in the floor, there's a hole in the wall, you know, if there's dropped cords somewhere, you don't want to get tripped or anything like that. So we were just doing our random stuff, doing a little basic filming and stuff. And we caught this. And if you can see, it's a picture image of a woman standing in the bathroom. And see, you see the normal picture in the corner of what the bathroom looks like. And if you see in the viewfinder of the camera, it's a woman holding a baby. Yeah, because what we usually do is we'll double up or triple on um, setting cameras up. So as you can see, the little small one is actually facing the bathroom. And then we have the video camera behind it. And the one that took that picture was a regular Canon camera. So there's three cameras right there. What you're actually seeing up in the upper left is what the small camera is actually seeing. And you notice there's nothing there. You don't see anything there. But the video camera is showing, well actually, yeah, you can see the woman holding the baby. Sir, can you zoom that at all? He want to know if you can zoom it in more. Zoom in more? Because huh. they said it's hazy back there. I'm not really sure. I mean, because sure. it's on a PowerPoint presentation that we yeah. got, so we really... Yeah. But after we're done, you're more than welcome to come up here and I'll show you. This is a different one. Now, this is basically the same aspect, the three cameras. you got the small one facing the bathroom, and uh, you got the video camera videoing the small one and then we have the cannon that took the picture but do you happen to see a figure that the small one picked up but we don't see it otherwise except right there which is really bizarre so this is actually at that plantation house it truly amazing all right types of what is it what did you yes yes 
Okay, now there are different types of hauntings. I'm not sure if you're all aware of these, but if you have an intelligent haunting, this basically is activity that reacts to changes in the environment. Meaning if you decide to move furniture around, it can see and realize and therefore make its presence known. So basically if you're in an old house and you decide to start moving stuff around, move the couch, move the table and all that, you're actually disrupting their habitat where they used to live and they're used to their area. Um, the activity can interact with the environment and they're usually known for moving objects, picture frames, glasses, papers and coffee mugs just to say, hey, stop moving stuff. Been in a room where there's a radio. We can barely hear you guys yeah. up here. Have you ever been in a room while you're in here playing the radio? And the radio station changed while you're sitting in there? The radio station changed while you're sitting there. Radio station changed? Yeah. He's asking, have you ever been in, in where a radio station changed all by itself? Yeah. Yeah. On the SB7. We've actually had that happen. Uh, residual. This is one that everybody usually encounters. Um, the activity repeats itself. We're talking about like a tape recorder that displays over and over again. There are issues where uh, certain spirit will actually relive the catastrophe or the traumatic event that they had. Um, it usually happens a certain path, same time, each day, month, year, etc. An entity with uh, no acknowledgement of the surroundings. So basically, if you move furniture, you move a doorway, or you knock out a wall, they're used to going that direction, so they will just go straight through that door, straight through that wall. Um, Prime will... example is, uh, how many of you been to Carbondale, Illinois, to the Carbondale Depot? If you go to the Carbondale Depot at 11 o'clock at night and at three o'clock in the morning, you will hear a train whistle and you will hear the cl trains clacking on the track. It's timed at that specific time and the story is back when it was a running depot in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that the train did stop at 11 o'clock at night and the train stopped again at 3 o'clock in the morning. So it's regenerating its history over and over again. Yeah, I was told you can hear the whistle. It's been counted many times, at least 50 plus times. People have actually sit out there and camped out. Cops have showed up and <laughs> ran people off, I was told. How many of y'all know what a poltergeist is? And not from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable, it is true to an extent. Um, the activity is usually sporadic and it's always around a young female. It's very rare with a male, but it's always around a young female um, that is having, well, okay. The female body produces great amount of energy during puberty. That's something new that we found out, but Hollywood depicts everything and destroys everything with doing poltergeist and all that, and just showing all these ghosts, uh, moving stuff, chairs and all that stuff, that not really a poltergeist. So, and let's see, demonic. That's a rarity. Um, I don't know if you guys know, there, there's really five actual documented cases of um, a demonic oppression where you actually had to have an exorcism. But lately, a lot of people are actually having issues now with demonic presences. Um, Usually, they will appear to you as an angelic being of beauty and that they can manipulate a person to commit some type of a sinful act out of the ordinary, or they can be horrific and evil looking. Some people claim to have seen demons that are incredibly hideous to look at. I believe demons just use this as a scare tactic, so basically they know what we fear, that's how they're going to show up to us. A black mist. I haven't quite heard about that, but it is very well possible. Some people that are having a demonic oppression will actually say they're being followed by a black mist or a black haze. Um, shadow people, we talked about that earlier. Um, usually you'll see those at the corner of your eyes. So if you're walking down a hallway, a dark hallway with your camera, you actually might see something dark. It's very well possible you might be seeing a shadow person. It's really hard to tell because at night, your eyes are trying to fix themselves in the room, 
especially when you're using a camera. So you have the LCD shining at you. You got your eyes trying to get fixated with the environment. And of course, you're starting to see stuff on the side of your peripheral. Let's see, a doppelganger. Anybody know what that is? Yeah. That's freaky. Um, this is a type of haunting a person gets to see his or her exact double. Um, wearing the same clothing that he or she has on. We've actually kind of sort of encountered this. She had a friend that our, her husband actually committed suicide. And um, their son has been away for like two weeks. She came home and saw him standing in the living room, just standing there, just looking at the wall. And then he just walked off. She tried to talk to him. He wouldn't talk back. Uh, it was like four hours later, he comes walking through the door. So she actually thought she saw her son right then and there. But I'm not too sure about that, but this is a actual German term for uh, body walker or something like that. And uh, it generally, generally signifies something tragic or traumatic is going to happen to this person. I don't know if you guys were aware of that, but... Uh, is it the same as like when there's a voice from, like, I'll hear my mom mm -hmm. talk, or my sister, or dad, or somebody, and they're not even home, or they're in bed, or they're in Lexington, you know? So you're talking about like a disembodied voice that's floating? Mm -hmm. This this kind of brings us to the signs and symptoms. Uh, mild psychokinetic occurrence where you might actually see doors opening and closing in person. You'll hear you'll start to hear whispers and cries or disembodied whispers or voices are heard throughout your house. Um, known voices. There you go. Sometimes you may hear a familiar voice echoing throughout the air. There's no telling what that could be. Um, some will say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some, some will actually say it could be evil, or someone trying to play tricks on you. Um, cold and hot spots, sudden variation in temperature is felt without a cause. Unexplained smells, which is a sudden smell or fragrance or cologne and present in your house. We've already gone over that. Physical assault. Now, this is when you actually experience a shove, a scratch, or getting slapped or hurt. Um, I've been kicked in the shin while doing it, uh, my introduction at the St. Albans Sanatorium, just walking on down the stairs. I had to stop, tell my cameraman, can you go ahead and stop? My shin started hurting. Rolled up my pant leg, and you can see a red mark to show that I got kicked. When well, I St. Albans didn't like you anyway. Well, yeah, basically. <laughs> he, we went on to what they call the catwalk, or what they call the birdcage, and uh, we walked through. There's nothing you can actually grab to hurt yourself on. Mm -hmm. And he walked outside and he was doing his uh, presentation about the birdcage and what the birdcage was meant for at St. Albans. And he had three little scratches on his hand and he was bleeding. Yep. And so we stopped and said, okay, let's go do some first aid. Always, that's another important thing. Make sure you have a first aid kit with you when you're oh, yeah. on the investigation. Most definitely. And so we went and downstairs so I can tend to his wound before we finish because, I, I mean, St. Albans is a torn down place. You don't want any infection. We don't need no hospital time, you know, any of those unfor certain bills. And so we got, by the time I got down there, the scratches were gone and the bleeding was completely gone. Mm -hmm. She had a strange one. We were over at the Malvern Manor in Malvern, Iowa. There is a specific room that she was in called Hank's Room. And she was in there just talking like well, you know, Hank didn't like female investigators yeah. so he didn't Hank like does me. not like females so I'm sitting there filming her and also she goes I'm, I'm feeling a burning sensation on my back and I'm just like yes you got scratched she's like well I'm not really uh, sharing your enthusiasm for that but I kind of put my camera down and walked over to her and kind of lifted the back of her shirt and there was a scratch going from her bra strap straight down down the center of my back no way I could reach it or anything but a lot of weird things happen, you know, when you're doing an investigation. Uh, we do a lot of Facebook Lives. I don't know if anybody watches us on Facebook Lives, but we did one from the Malvern Manor because I had a couple people say, hey, can you go ahead and put your, do Facebook Live on the DVR so we can watch it? Hey, that's a great idea because that way I can go inside while people are watching it on the outside. She thinks, well, hey, I'm going to do something cool too. I'm going to pull it up on my phone. 
So we're in a place called Shadow Hallway, and a lot of things happen in that hallway, but we wanted to experience it for ourselves. So I'm setting up a thermal camera and a full spectrum camera facing down the hallway. She looks at her phone and she's like, Gavin, there's somebody rummaging through your stuff. <laughs> I'm like, what? what? I go and look and sure enough, you can see a guy doing this. And it's a this. dark shadow figure. You do not see a face. It mm -hmm. looks like someone dressed completely in black. You're thinking, oh, Tommy Robber with the mask, you know, the whole ordeal. Yep. And we're over there going, oh my God, there's someone rummaging through our stuff. He makes a beeline, leaves me behind, <laughs> he makes yep. off the beeline and goes outside. By the time he gets outside, there is nobody there. There never was. There never was. I checked the DVR footage. I asked people on Facebook. I said, did you see any black shadow over my stuff? They said, nope. But we saw it on her phone. This is where it gets kind of funky. After packing everything up in the trailer, getting ready to leave, I can't find my lock. I had to zip tie the trailer door shut because my lock's gone. So a couple days later, I was talking to a friend of mine that's a psychic, and we were talking about the Malvern Manor. And she goes, oh, you guys encountered Hank. I'm like, what do you mean? Oh, he's a klepto. <laughs> OK. So I go ahead and uh, call Josh, who's actually there, that does the tours and everything at the Malvern Manor. He said that he got done doing a tour, opened up the dresser drawer, and there was my lock on top of Hank's pajamas. <laughs> so a lot of crazy things like that happened. It's just really bizarre. Um, but as you can see right there on that one laptop, we were the first ever to go to the Massac uh, County Courthouse. A lot of people did not know it's haunted. We didn't know it was haunted either. We got contacted. Yeah. We just went in there to go ahead and do a B-roll footage for Tascam. So we were going to go ahead and film us using their equipment. And we started having some weird things happen. We had Jack and Juanita. They're the ones that invited us there. So they were sitting downstairs in the hallway in the lobby. Me and Paula were down in the basement. They're talking. We were talking. And all of a sudden, Paula goes, I think someone showed up. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, there's someone up there with a, a deep voice. I'm like, okay. So we go upstairs. Hey, who are you guys talking to? And they looked at us like, what? Nobody. And they go, wait a minute, where did you just come from? Oh, we came from the basement. He go, we thought you were upstairs. Sure enough, we listened to the audio. There were four of us present. Five, five voices. voices. We went ahead and handed it off to a friend of ours that does audio uh, recognition to check all the audio files. And sure enough, there were five voices, not just four. So with that, the city said, hey, come on in here and investigate. So we set up, we went in there, we started investigating, and we weren't really getting anything at the time, so she decided to go take her phone and do a Facebook Live, because we do, we do Facebook Lives all the time, because we like to bring our viewers in and immerse them within the episodes that we're filming. So she walks around, I walk around, we join up, and things start happening, weird things, like the dandy box down there. That actually, uh, started moving all by itself when we were in the courtroom up on the second floor. And after it stopped, you could hear someone walking down the, the steps out the door. And you can hear the door shut. And there was nobody there except me and her. And that dandy box was going off all by itself. But there were so many things. And the funny thing is, it was live on Facebook. Everybody that was watching, we had like over 42 people watching. So anything that happened, it was real, 100%. But see, that will move all by itself if yeah, somebody touches it. Yeah, because for the box, it's kind of like you can do two things with it. You can do an EVP session with it, or you can use it as a motion sensor and just walk away. Mm -hmm. We were happening talking about something that was going on, and uh, we were just doing nonchalant talking about the courtroom and this, that, and the other. Then all of a sudden, we started having the center one start doing this back mm -hmm. and forth we weren't moving we were barely stationed still and then all of a sudden it stopped and then he walked around the other side and was watching it It was still completely still and then all of a sudden he got really really cold oh yeah as if somebody was standing right spot. beside him and then all of a sudden the dainty box went again and i'm on the other side where i happen to be where the jurors box is in the courtroom upstairs 
So he's on one side of the jury box. This is sitting on the bar to the jury box. I'm on the other side of the jury box. He gets a cold spell after he leaves. This goes off again. It stops again. I get extremely cold and then you literally hear you literally hear sounds like someone with footsteps running and racing to the back of the to the courtroom and then you hear this. And that was it. Yeah. There were other things that actually happened. There was a ladder that's in the courtroom area. Up above, there's a crawl space, maybe about that much room. Nobody can walk up there, but we heard somebody walking up there. So when I looked up, I said, if there's anybody up there, show yourself like that. The rope is wrapped around the ladder, so it kind of weaves around. It started spinning all by itself, and we got that on footage too mm -hmm. so everything actually happened live on Facebook and we still have the live up too so if you ever want to go to yeah the was that the old jail, jail room? yeah the jail is up on the third floor this was it back there where the judges chambers is there's yeah. the access room but but no. we did have something happen in the jail though um, we were up there in one of the jail cells and we had Lori Johnson who is the psychic medium for uh, Ghost of Shepherdstown she actually was watching the stream and she said, I see two faces behind you. So I shine a flashlight, you don't see anything. But you're looking at the camera and I'm like, there's two faces coming through the wall. And she said, uh, one of those is the name Rebecca. Rebecca's sticking to me. I, I don't know, Rebecca and Mama. Yeah, well, and the deal is I had an EVP already earlier than that night on Rebecca. And of course I haven't talked about Alice yet. Alice is another, uh, communication device that we use and it's kind of like an ovulus but it's different and it it I have 80% accuracy on Alice mm -hmm. and uh, I kept getting Rebecca and I kept getting mama because earlier in the courtroom going back to that main courtroom again Gavin was trying to position a camera because I was doing an EVP session well he was trying to manhandle this camera and everything and it was like yeah, I told him, I said, can't you just stay still for a second? And he goes, no, I'm trying to situate this camera. So he decided to sit down in this chair. And when he sat down in this chair, I got him gotten across Alice that is uh, sit and chair. No. I got in trouble. And I was like, well, who is telling me no? And I had gotten the word mama. And then I was like, well, who is mama? I can't really call you mama because you're not my mama. And she's like, Rebecca. And so... This is, and this is when we were not live. We were doing this. This was we, before we went live. Yeah, this was before we went live. I had gotten Rebecca and Mama, and plus mm -hmm. we got Rebecca back at base camp when we was recharging stuff right. while we were going to go do mm -hmm. Facebook Live. But it was amazing how Lori was able to validate that with us on yeah. that. Yeah, so when we were up there, she saw the lady's face coming through the wall, mm -hmm. and she said, that's Rebecca. And then one thing is, she told me, she goes, uh, you need to be careful because something bad's about to happen. I hate when someone tells me that. <laughs> sure enough, walking on down the stairs, and if you watch it closely, I get pushed down the steps. I'm walking with a $400 gimbal, and next thing you know, you can see me going diagonal straight down. So, yeah, that, that place, there's something there, and not really sure what it is. So, anyway, I hope you all enjoyed this. We had a great time, so we'd like to thank you for coming.